role that religion plays when it comes to determining truth in history will forever be a subjective and a fairly controversial topic. Science has, to a great degree at least, displaced the authority of religion when it comes to history. But it's really just not that simple, and the further back in time that we go, the more the lines between the two are blurred. In fact, in recent years, science is revealing some of the truths that are hidden deep in the metaphorical stories of our religions, and the conclusions that they seem to indicate are startling. We know, without any doubt, that mankind has been witness to some truly global cataclysms during our short time here on Earth. Events like nothing we've ever seen since well before civilization is ever supposed to have started, or been restarted, if you're familiar with my perspective on civilization. Yet, in the overall timeline of our species, these were still events that occurred relatively recently. The largest of these was undoubtedly the Younger Dryas cosmic impact of roughly some 12,800 years ago. The event that precipitated the extinction of fully half of the megafaunal species living on the planet at the time. It's possible that the many tales of cataclysm and of disaster, of flood and of fire that falls from the sky, tales that are shared across so many religions, across so many civilizations, and across millennia of time, may be nothing more than preserved and inherited eyewitness accounts of events that were so terrible, so destructive, so traumatic that they left a permanent genetic scar upon humanity. A scar such that to this day, we still attribute these events not to nature, but to the wrath of angry gods. My name is Ben, and this is Uncharted X. Let's talk about gods and cataclysms and history. This is probably a good time to issue a little trigger warning. If you're the sort who gets easily outraged, at least in the biblical sense, then this might not be the right video for you. For my part, at least, I was not raised to believe in any specific deity beyond Santa Claus. This is something that I'm eternally grateful to my parents for, although I suspect it wasn't really a plan so much as just a tacit agreement between them that there were better things to do on the weekend than attend the same lecture over and over again. Context is everything in this case, so let's set some. The Age of Enlightenment and the influence of the scientific revolution that took place in Europe throughout the 18th century laid the foundations for the modern world that we live in today. This was also known as the Age of Reason, and it was an intellectual movement that examined the fundamental principles of what it meant to be a human living amongst other humans. Science, economics, theory of government, philosophy, law, all were advanced tremendously during this period by great thinkers like Isaac Newton, René Descartes, Immanuel Kant, Adam Smith, John Locke, Voltaire, and others. The thinking of this time laid the groundwork for the political revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. The French Revolution, as well as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, are considered to be products of this era, as these emerging academic and philosophical disciplines had notably undermined the, up until this point in history, absolute authority of the church and of organized religions. They challenged the feudalistic notion of the divine right of kings to rule over others, although that fella Marx eventually took it a little bit too far. The very notion of the separation of church and state traces its roots back to this time in history, and the rapid rise of science began to displace religious dogma as the arbiter of the unknown. Perhaps there is no better example of this intellectual distancing from religion that occurred during this period than what happened in the field that we know today as geology. In Europe, up until this point, the geological evolution of the world had been entirely dictated by whatever creation story the latest cult that was running the place that day happened to be selling. And in this case, it was the literal cataclysm as defined in the Bible, and specifically Genesis. You might have heard the story, God was annoyed, it rained a little bit, and everybody drowned, except for one clearly right-wing prepper dude building a decently sized wooden dinghy in his front yard. He sent out a plus one invite and the address for the boat launching party to every species of animal that existed on the planet, although one wonders if he really had to invite the wasps and not the unicorns. Eventually, after a couple of thousand years of being told this tale and saying, yeah, sounds right, yeah, people started squinting their eyes and crunching the numbers and the whole thing kind of fell apart. That is, unless you're an extremely rich Aussie creationist named Ken, in which case you go and build a massive ARC-based theme park in Kentucky, complete with life-size models of humans riding dinosaurs. I gotta say, if God does in fact exist, he certainly has a sense of humour, as this theme park was damaged in 2018 by, of all things, heavy rain and flooding. 
Yeah, good on you, Ken, mate. You follow your dreams, you build a bloody river over there. <laughs> Australia. Anyway, the guys working on geology back in the Age of Reason were very much against all of this talk of cataclysm. They came up with this thing called uniformitarianism, or gradualism, basically the direct opposite idea to the catastrophism that's contained in so many religions. This principle of gradualism stated that rather than being caused by big and dramatic events, things like giant global floods, the geological features of the world could be all explained by the very slow processes of water and wind erosion and things like that, the almost gentle processes that we see working on the landscape all day every day. Using gradualism as a way to explain literally everything, no matter how convoluted or implausible the details end up being, in a deliberate attempt to get away from the catastrophism of religion, this was a stated goal for more than 50 years in geology during this time. And it was something of an overcorrection. Which is why the brilliant work of guys like Randall Carlson and J. Harlan Bretz before him, these guys, the work they're doing is just so important because they're straightening out these overcorrections of the past. And we're learning that areas like the channeled scablands of eastern Washington state are in fact the result of some truly cataclysmic events and not just of gradual erosion. The evidence for widespread and sudden destruction is being uncovered all over the planet as our scientific methods and our understanding improves. Sedimentary analysis from around the world shows evidence of the global effects from gigantic cosmic impacts at the end of the Pleistocene era, a period also known as the Younger Dryas. Shock synthesized nano diamonds, extraterrestrial platinum and iridium spikes, as well as evidence for unimaginable levels of biomass burning up to 10% of all the biomass on the planet is evidenced in a black matte layer, and this has been found in both northern and southern hemisphere locations. The astonishing advance of LiDAR imagery, now available for huge chunks of the United States, has revealed the extent of the saturation bombardment that occurred and resulted in the formation of the hundreds of thousands of formations known as the Nebraska Rainwater Basins and the Carolina Bays. Many scientists have contributed to this recent discovery, but none more so than Antonio Zamora whose published peer-reviewed papers posit that these bays and basins were formed as a result of huge ice boulders that were ejected into suborbital trajectories from a single point on the other end of the continent, ejected as fallout or splash damage from an extraterrestrial cosmic impact that landed into the two mile thick Laurentide ice sheet. I recently interviewed Antonio and we discussed this topic in depth. It was a fascinating conversation. The links to that are below. The entirety of the southwestern United States appears to have been subject to a truly gigantic flood that deposited a single sedimentary layer over the entire area. And you can see this layer in the arroyos and the canyons of this place, and it's meters deep. The incredibly violent floods that carved out the channeled scablands did so within only a few days. And there are many other examples of mega flood landscapes from all around the world that are now being evaluated as such. Landscapes like the English Channel, which was above the sea level during the Ice Age, yet shows evidence of cataclysmic flooding. The English Channel was submerged at the end of the Pleistocene, along with some 10 million square miles of coastal land from all around the globe, as sea levels rose around 400 feet in a very short period of time, to roughly the same level that they're at today. The new world that we live in, the world that was created by the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, has truly been built on the ruins of the old. There's a world of detail in this, and I really can't recommend any YouTube channel more highly than Geocosmic Rex, which is Randall Carlson's channel, particularly if you're looking to spend a few hours learning things and having your mind expanded. Randall is a teacher like no other. I have the very highest level of respect for him and the work that he does. It really blows my mind that his channel only has 29k subs, so go subscribe to his channel if you haven't done that already. Personally speaking, I wish, I wish that we lived in a world where it's guys like Randall at the top of the YouTube list with 100 million subscribers, rather than the host of vapid e-celebrities playing Minecraft or doing other equally mindless things that turns into content that gets all the views. Silly humans. The examples for recent scientific evidence supporting worldwide and traumatically destructive events that occurred at the end of the last glaciation period or around the period 13,000 years ago could just go on and on. Evidence points to a series of cosmic impacts as the source for this destruction, 
likely several large fragments from a disintegrating comet that lurked within the Taurid media stream. And this is something that we still cross twice a year, every year, in the Earth's journey around the Sun. In recent months, a huge crater has been found under the glacial ice that's still present in Greenland. It's called the Hiawatha Crater, and preliminary assessments indicate that it dates to within the same Younger Dryas period, although investigations are still ongoing to more accurately date this crater. Considering that mankind undeniably witnessed these events, and as a species we managed to survive the cataclysm, unlike the other 50% of megafaunal species that didn't, and also given that today we are developing at least a rough idea of what happened in this period, we now have something of a baseline to evaluate some of the stories that come to us through various religious texts and traditions. We should also remember the nature and the role that religious myths and stories play, both today and in times gone by. High literacy rates are a truly modern phenomenon. The ability to read, or let alone write, was once extremely rare. So humans had to rely on oral tales in order to preserve knowledge. We're natural storytellers, and there is something in our nature that also makes us susceptible to being told good stories. There's really nothing quite like it. It's why we all love a good movie or a great book. Religious texts and tales have always leveraged this part of human nature. Be it events, or a moral lesson, or some sort of teaching, even natural phenomena, they all get personified into stories of gods, or into stories of beings and people that we can actually relate to. And the information is conveyed in a context that is entertaining and memorable. And these stories are thus preserved throughout time, they're passed along as oral traditions from one generation to the next. This is more or less how organised religions got their start. The priests of the church were the only ones with this information. They would read and interpret the word of God to the unwashed, uneducated masses. And wielding this sort of authority is a quick way to gain power over people that couldn't read it for themselves. This mechanism of the church being the absolute authority on the word of God was tightly controlled, right up until the invention of the printing press when things started to get a little bit out of hand. Now anybody could get access to the written word, and anybody could interpret the word of God for themselves, and anyone could claim to be the person with the magic walkie-talkie that was connected directly to the boss upstairs, and they knew exactly what he meant by all the these and the thous and the thou shalt nots. As a result, we had a splintering into the different factions of Christianity, many of which are still in existence today. I really do like Jordan Peterson's take on all of this, that gods and religions are really nothing more than an allegory for various aspects of what was thought to be ideal human behaviours and traits of the time. Warlike cultures had warlike gods, and rather than gods creating us in their image, it seems much more likely to me that we created them in ours. As cultures and civilizations went to war, so did their gods, eventually amalgamating into new deities, representing new ideals for humanity. In many cases, this amalgamation preserved the essence of the lesson, or of the story, or of the character, as it moved from one religion and culture into the next. Many of you will know that this is still the case today, as many of the characters and stories in our Abrahamic religions are directly lifted from the older religions and gods that they replaced. I suspect both as a mechanism to allow people to migrate easily into a new faith and to preserve some of the fundamental records of events or of moral lessons that those specific stories entailed. I think this is why we see such a consistent set of themes and stories that are spread across almost every religion, both ancient and modern, that talk about cataclysm. They talk about the world being remade. They talk about our ancestors barely surviving this and having to then repopulate the world. I think that in many cases, these stories are preserving what are essentially eyewitness accounts of the unimaginable cataclysm that actually occurred. And that these stories have been passed down through many civilizations, through many religions, and they almost always attribute this destruction as the wrath of gods and as having been sent to punish mankind. I'd imagine that if you were around and you saw anything like what they describe in the book of Revelation, you'd think that God was fairly pissed off also. How else do you rationalize such a cataclysmic series of events as anything other than God's fiery wrath? Nobody likes to think that it's just chance that we're here, that our entire existence is continually and precariously balanced against the randomness of the cosmic shooting gallery that we happen to live in. This understanding of the scale of the universe is only one of the many gifts that modern science gives us. 
But it can also lead to a sense of nihilism that comes from realising just how insignificant we are in the scale and scope of the universe. It can become something of a depressing and existential crisis for many people. And this is a relatively modern conundrum for the human character. It's one of the downsides to thinking too much about the size of the pond that we're all splashing about in. I personally happen to know what this feels like, and for what it's worth, for anybody else that finds themselves stuck in that space of existential dread, pondering infinity, it can be balanced by also observing the whimsy and the wonder of the world around us. Understanding the beauty and the privilege of being alive and born into a human body. And the realization that nothing, nothing at all really matters but the moment that we're in right now. And that there's absolutely no proof that any of this, any of this business is actually serious. Even if reality itself is nothing more than a simulation running on the cosmic computers of the future, all we can do is make the most of the time that we have. Back in the good old days, when these stories of cataclysm and destruction were first penned down on paper, this existential crisis based on the concept of infinity really wasn't an issue. Humans were more or less convinced that the world ended just over the visible horizon, and that the gods and the heavens revolved around them, and that everything had meaning, everything had purpose. If you were in their place during those times, what would you think when you saw the comet fragments come streaking down out of the sky? Consider what we know about the Younger Dryas, about that tumultuous period that happened at the end of the Ice Age, a period that we undoubtedly witnessed as a species. And then consider these passages from Chapter 8 of the Book of Revelations and ask yourself, what is it that's really being described here? Quoting loosely from the Book of Revelations, Chapter 8. I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from heaven. It fell on a third of the rivers and springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. So many of the people died from the waters because they had been made bitter. The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone for not a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. End quote. These descriptions continue in Revelations 9, verses 1 and 2. Quote, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. End quote. Sounds like a pretty lurid description of cosmic impacts and their aftermath effects to me, all personified and attributed to supernatural beings. Think about it, if you were a few generations removed from this event, you probably wouldn't remember a story about a very cosmically unlucky day where bad stuff happened. But once you wrap the tale up in religion, you personify it, you deify it, you put structure around the event, it becomes something that is much more likely to be remembered and to be retold. The fallout from such an event would have had global consequences, and these consequences would have endured for months on end. The sun would have been blacked out for a long time, earthquakes, fire and flood would have raged across the planet. There are many other passages that describe what are essentially the secondary effects that would have resulted from gigantic cosmic impacts. This is Revelation chapter 6 verse 12, quote, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood. End quote. 
Up and down the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New, there are many descriptions of events that can easily be interpreted as first-hand accounts of cosmic disasters. Here's Joel chapter 2, verses 31 and 32. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 6, quote, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. End quote. The famous Sodom and Gomorrah story, which comes from the 19th chapter of Genesis. Quote, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. End quote. Another example from 2 Peter 3 verses 10 to 13. Quote, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. End quote. Talk about harnessing global tragedies for your own ends, with all the talk of whereeth dwelleth righteousness. Righteousness dwelleth where we say it dwelleth, damn it. The principle of never let a good disaster go to waste clearly isn't just a modern political technique, it's just human nature. We've been harnessing these types of events for millennia. There are other religious texts outside of Christianity that also seem to capture the essence of what it might have been like to directly witness such a cataclysm. The Vedic texts, the Sanskrit epics of ancient India, in particular the Mahabharata, are quite literal. Indeed, they even call out the destruction caused by meteor storms specifically. And once again, note with these quotes, the description of what I can only interpret as cosmic impacts has been deified and personified into tales. And in this case, they describe the whole process as a mythological cosmic weapon called the Brahmashisha Astra, something that was capable of killing gods, and it functioned by unleashing a literal swarm of meteors. In Mahabharata, it's explained when this weapon gets invoked, quote, it blazes up with terrible flames within a huge sphere of fire. Numerous peals of thunder were heard, thousands of meteors fell and all living creatures became terrified with great dread. The entire sky seemed to be filled with noise and assumed a terrible aspect with flames of fire. The whole earth with her mountains and waters and trees trembled." End quote. Other quotes from the Mahabharata. Various omens appeared among the gods. Winds blew, meteors fell in thousands. Thunder rolled through a cloudless sky. Drona called Arjuna and said, Accept from this irresistible weapon called Brahmastra, but you must promise never to use it against a human foe, for if you did, it might destroy the world. At last they came to blows, and seizing their maces struck each other. They fell like falling suns. End quote. Some more verses from the Mahabharata. It was a single projectile, charged with all the power of the universe an incandescent column of smoke and flame, as bright as a thousand suns, rose in all its splendor. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vrishnas and the Anhakas." End quote. And this is perhaps my favorite quote from all of these, again from the Mahabharata, quote, These will all take place at the end of the Yuga, and when men become fierce and destitute of virtue, then does the Yuga come to an end. The course of the winds will be confused and agitated. Innumerable meteors will flash through the sky, foreboding evil. And then the sun will appear with six others of the same kind. And all around will be din and uproar. And everywhere there will be conflagrations. And fires will blaze up on all sides when the end of the Yuga comes." End quote. I find it pretty interesting here that there are described seven suns in the sky in the Mahabharata, and in Revelations we have seven angels with trumpets. Perhaps this means there were seven major impacts during the Younger Dryas, and certainly the latest research points to multiple impacts happening during this period. What about some other religions from across time or from around the world? Well, the Mayan codices state, quote, At the close of the ages it hath been decreed, the world shall be purged with fire. End quote. From the indigenous traditions of Brazil, quote, Monan, without beginning or end, author of all that is, seeing the ingratitude of men and their contempt for him who had made them thus joyous, withdrew from them and sent upon them Tata, the divine fire, which burned all there was on the surface of the earth. End quote. Also the Nordic traditions, this is the Elder Eddis, quote, 
Surt from the south comes with flickering flame. The sun darkens, earth in ocean sinks, fall from heaven the bright stars. Fire breath assails the all-nourishing tree, towering fire plays against heaven itself. End quote. These analogies to cosmic impacts are just endless. Daniel G. Brinton wrote in The Myths of the New World, which was published in 1868, about the tribes of South America, quote, By far the greater number represent the last destruction of the world to have been by water. A few, however, attribute it to a general conflagration which swept over the whole earth, consuming every living thing except a few who took refuge in a deep cave. End quote. The more you look into these creation stories, the more a consistent set of events or a consistent set of themes seems to emerge. We have descriptions that seem to be bearing witness to the asteroid or the comet fragments themselves actually entering the atmosphere, with talks of mountains ablaze with fire, or of stars falling from the sky and burning like torches. We also have many descriptions that concern what is essentially the aftermath of such an event. Cataclysmic wildfires, earthquakes, violent electrical storms, seemingly unending periods of rainout, the blackout of the sun, the moon and the stars, along with just general destruction and mayhem, all of which, as modern scientific evidence shows, actually took place during the Younger Dryas. And of course, there were tidal waves and there was flooding. Flooding like we could barely even imagine, even with the assistance of Hollywood. It's no wonder that tales of apocalyptic flooding are perhaps the single most prevalent theme amongst all of these creation stories. Now, I'm not going to claim that every single flood tale in religious creation stories is an account of the Younger Dryas, specifically, but rather I'm saying that the types of floods that are described in these stories most definitely took place in the distant past. Natural disasters can and will continue to lay waste to large areas of the earth without ever needing meteorites or impactors to get them going. But if you want some real destruction, accept no substitute for cosmic impacts. They not only are tremendously destructive just in their own right, but they cause the full spectrum of natural disasters like earthquakes, flood and fires simply as side effects. And I think that it's these types of events that are the most likely source for the creation stories that are preserved by so many different religions. Evidence suggests that the Younger Dryas cosmic impacts were the biggest things to have hit the planet in more than 5 million years. But they weren't the only things to do so during the last 300,000 years or so of human existence on planet Earth. Burkle Crater, which is a 30 kilometer wide hole that sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean, seems to be the result of a pretty decent sized impact that occurred somewhere around the time of 3000 BCE, or roughly 5000 years ago. We know the dates for Burkle Crater because scientists have carbon dated the organic material from the ocean floor, material that was washed up onto the land by the giant tsunamis as a result of the impact. And this material was left in giant chevrons that are up to 600 feet high. These deposits have been left miles inland from the coasts of both Madagascar and Western Australia. Burkle Crater wasn't really on the same scale as the Younger Dryas, but it would have caused extended periods of global rainout from all of the water vapour, and the impact would have just wrecked the Middle East as the same tidal waves would have flowed north into the Arabian Sea. This is the very region that the Flood of Noah traces its origins back to, with Genesis and several other of the texts of the Old Testament going back to the Yahwist source of around the 6th century BCE. This Yahwist source also seems to have been assembled from older tales and from older religions, as the details in the story of Noah's flood seem to come directly from some much older flood myths, which also trace their origins back to the Middle East. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the Babylonian tale from nearly 3000 BCE, speaks of a world-ending flood, of an ark, of animals being loaded onto it two by two, and of only a few people surviving the event. The ancient Babylonian epic of Atrahasis from roughly 2000 BCE tells the same tale of a global flood that was sent by the gods. It talks about a single wise man named Atrahasis, which translates to exceedingly wise. And Atrahasis was warned about the flood and he was told to build an ark. He loaded two of each type of animal onto said ark and thus survived the flood to rebuild civilization again afterwards. 
To me, it seems very likely that these flood accounts that have made their way down into the dominant religions of today might well all be due to this Burkle Crater event, but it's also possible that their memories of some even earlier mega floods, like those that would have taken place as a consequence of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. Now, while we could spend another 15 minutes looking at more examples of flood or fire stories from cultures around the world, of which there are many, my point here is that these accounts, at least the essence of them, seem to be grounded in truth. So if there is a kernel of truth in these events that have been recorded through time by religions, what other truths might we find in these stories and in these traditions? Along with depictions of cosmic impacts and cataclysms, many of these ancient cultures also describe a time of civilization that existed before the cataclysm. It's often described as a golden era of peace and prosperity, a time of high knowledge and of almost magical capability. In many cultures, these beings are described as gods. In others, they are great civilizers or demigods with fearsome powers. Viracocha of Peru and his followers, along with many other examples of what could be interpreted as advanced technology, was said to ride in boats that moved without sails and made, quote, snakes of the water, end quote, which to me sounds just how the wake from a fast-moving boat might be described by somebody who had no context for that information. Perhaps the strongest case for written records of a lost golden age that existed in ancient times before the cataclysm comes to us from ancient Egypt. And I'm going to close this video out with a brief examination of what they said about the origins of civilization. Their own history, as recorded by the dynastic Egyptians, goes back much further than our mainstream acceptance of the age of their civilization states. And not just by a little bit, we're talking by many tens of thousands of years. We somewhat arbitrarily, in today's times, decide just how much of this history is actual history and then how much of it we're going to label as simply myth. This story of the true lineage of Egypt has been quite well preserved. Of particular note is the papyrus of the Turin's King's List, and then also there is the just beautiful artwork and plaster inscriptions of the Abydos King's List that's housed on the walls of the Temple of Seti I in Abydos. The creation story of ancient Egypt talks of a time called Zeptepi, the time of the gods, the ten Neteru who reigned for more than 20,000 years. After them came the Shemsu Hor, or followers of Horus, semi-divine kings and the keepers of sacred knowledge, who ruled this area for more than 6,000 years, and this all took place in the times before the dynastic Egyptian civilization, at least as we know it, ever actually arose. And again, this is quite similar to Viracocha and other great civilizers, but the Shemsu Hor seem to have had almost magical capability, at least from the perspective of the dynastic Egyptians, which is, to my mind, how a relatively primitive person might actually describe something like advanced technology if they don't have the correct context for it. This same civilization, the ancient Egyptian civilization, one of the very first to emerge from the Stone Age, at least according to the mainstream view, describes itself as a legacy civilization of these earlier and clearly more advanced ancestors. Their own creation story also includes hints to global flooding and to massive depopulation of the earth, and then of humans slowly being retaught civilization afterwards. Many people seem to think that the Egyptian mythology contains no links to mega floods, but that's simply not the case. And I have to thank a poster called Chris M for collating this list of Egyptian flood interpretations in a post on the forum on Graham Hancock's website way back in 2002. Quoting from the post by author Chris M. Quote, Hathor went to earth and slew millions of humans. The streets of the town of Chinetnan began to run like a river with blood because of her horrific endeavour. So much blood drained into the Nile that it overflowed the river banks, and the bloody water flooded the land, destroying everything. This water eventually ran into the sea, which overflowed as well. Hathor began drinking this horrible mixture of blood and water. Ra was displeased with Hathor's work, as he had only wanted to punish and not destroy the human race. So he asked Thoth, the wisest god, for help. He then told the goddess Sektet to mix together dada, fruit and barley to make beer. The beer was then to be mixed with human blood in the hopes it would attract Hathor. 
Ra's servants were then ordered to pour out the mixture on the remaining land near Hathor. The beer became a great sea and Hathor was drawn to it by the smell of the blood. She drank the beer until she was so intoxicated that she staggered off to sleep, leaving the last few humans behind. From those humans, Earth was repopulated. Ra left the upkeep of Earth to Thoth from then on, and he went off to rest on the back of the great cow of heaven. Thoth taught humans how to be civilized. End quote. So once again, if you strip away the supernatural entities and the personification of this tale, we have essentially here a description of a civilization that was destroyed, presumably by a flood, and it left only a few humans behind. And after some time, in which Earth was apparently repopulated, Thoth then taught humans how to be civilized once more. The essence of this story is just repeated again and again in so many religious myths and legends from all around the world. And there's a consistent message being passed on to us down through time if we have the patience and skill to decipher it. The kernels of truth in these stories that speak of cataclysm and of the world being remade through cosmic fire, through mega floods and disaster, these tales are being proven out time and time again by modern science, and the evidence for this is writ large on the landscape itself. These legends also speak of a time before the cataclysm, a time of high civilization, of high capability, and yet for all that, it was a civilization that was almost utterly destroyed. Is this aspect of creation tales also just manufactured myth? Or is this in fact a warning for our civilization? A reminder that cosmic destruction can and will visit our planet again, and a notification that maybe we're not the sum total of human progress, and that we should keep our wits about us when it comes to the long game of survival, lest we once more fall off the cosmic hamster wheel of human civilization. What other truths might we find embedded in the myths and legends of the past if we continue to put the pieces of this puzzle together? Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that look at some of the connections to cataclysm that are contained in religious stories and myths from all around the world. I know that there are plenty of other examples that I didn't touch on, but my point was essentially to connect some of these legends and the essence of these stories to the truth of what's actually happened on the planet. I think there's an entire other category of truth that's contained in religious myths and legends. That's all pretty much outlined in this book here, Hamlet's Mill. It's just an incredible piece of work that connects, you know, a lot of cultures to the procession of the equinox, to the, the numerology of the specifics in religions. Very much worth a read. There's also an excellent summary of what's contained in it in chapter 30 of Graham Hancock's seminal piece of work, Fingerprints of the Gods. I do want to say that this wasn't intended to be a criticism of anybody's faith or religion. Uh, I think we all go through this journey of life on our own path. We're all searching for connection, for community. And I know a lot of people find that in these communities and in these faiths. It's not something that I ever went through as a kid. But, but that said, you know, I, I have a deep connection to spirituality and I have a, a general belief in the cosmos, if you like, a connection to the, the world around me. I, I think anybody can embrace that. I don't think you need the structure and the dogma of organized religions to do so. I also know this has been a little bit of a departure from the regular type of video that I've been doing. I will get back to looking more specifically at ancient sites, but I think this is a super important aspect of trying to decode the overall picture and understand the truth of what's happened uh, to, to human civilization on this planet. So if you like the kind of work I'm doing, if you want to see me continue to do it, uh, please do consider supporting the channel via the value for value model. You can find out all the ways to do that at unchartedx.com slash support. And as always, I just want to sincerely thank everybody that's been supporting the channel. I've had some just tremendous support recently from a few individuals. You guys know who you are. Uh, you're making a real difference in my ability to do this. We've just passed 40,000 subs. It's surreal. 
I never would have thought that the channel could get here in, in such a short amount of time. So, you know, thank you again to all the new subscribers and I look forward to uh, continuing this work. The value for value model is pretty simple. It goes along the lines of that if you get some value from the work that I'm doing, please do consider returning some of that value back to me. Maybe it's worth the price of a cup of coffee or a movie ticket, or maybe even a monthly subscription on Patreon, Subscribestar, those types of things. I very much appreciate the support that I do get. It means that I can spend more time making and editing these videos. It's just a brutal editing process for some of these. But I hope to continue doing it. I hope to get to a sustainable model and I will see you all in the next video. Peace.